Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Rick Games Edicom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with a leaked review of the i7-9700K, and this is from the website El Chapaz Informatico. I'm going to place a link to their full review in the video description, but we're going to be sharing a couple of slides here. Uh, and I did get this information via video cards, so to be fair to them, I'm also crediting them as well in the video description. Now, a couple of things. Firstly, the CPU, of course, we all know, has been soldered with the ninth generation processors, so there has been a lot of speculation what we can be receiving the, from the uh, overclocking gods. Is it going to be like 5.5 gigahertz, 5.6 gigahertz, or whatever? Well, according to this article, they managed to squeeze 5 gigahertz out of this particular processor. Their cooler is a liquid Corsair H80i GT, and they're running this with a 1200 watt power supply, so obviously that's not the issue, as well as a Z390 motherboard as well. This is probably a good indication of what most people are running in terms of an AIO, or what a really decent air cooler is probably capable of at the limits. So obviously it's possible that they did get a bad silicon sample, so you do need to take that into consideration. So the i7-9700K is of course eight cores, but without hyper-threading. So we are looking at just eight threads here. So what is the performance? So first up is Cinebench, and the 9700K does slightly pit the 8700K to the post here. Yes, the results are only around 50 points, but still that does help, and it does mean that it's within spitting distance of the Ryzen 7 1700X, although of course the 2700X with its much more aggressive clock speeds does win here. And it's also top of the charts with Fire Strike with the CPU score as well, scoring 16,633 points compared to 16,530 of the 8700K. Now, what about gaming? Well, gaming's a bit of a difficult one because they are running this with a GTX 1070. It is a gaming Z from MSI, but obviously the better situation would have been at least a 1080 or preferably a 1080 Ti, but it is what it is. But you can see that their results are pretty compelling. And obviously their averages here do slightly demonstrate that the i7-9700K for example, in Resident Evil 7, is a frame or two faster than the 2700X or the 8700K. So it's not a massive jump or anything like that. This is probably going to be one of those processes where if you've not jumped on a Ryzen system, if you've not jumped on a eighth generation system, then it doesn't hurt any to go ahead and uh, upgrade now. But if you've not done so, you know, you might not be that much in a rush. Although I will stress, of course, that A, they might have had a bad silicon sample with the overclocking. B, this is only one set of reviews, so we're going to have to wait for more. And C, this does not include other processors like the 8600K and, of course, the 9900K, which is obviously going to be more expensive, but still, if performance is your thing, well, there you go. Just because you're special to me, though, I do have a couple of leaks concerning the i9-9900K and the 9600K in terms of benchmarks. We're going to start things out with the 9900K, then we'll move to the 9600K, and these come to us through uh, Geekbench. So Geekbench, we're looking at 6,248 for single-core performance and 33,037 for multi-core performance of the i9-9900K. That's pretty impressive, to be honest with you. But what about the 9600K? Just a quick reminder, the 9600K has two fewer cores than what the 9700K does. So we're down to just six cores, six physical threads. But still, it's a pretty respectable score. We're looking at 6,027 for the single core and 23,472 for multi-core. That is significantly better than what many 8600Ks will put out. So what you can essentially say is that the 9600K is the uh, 8600K, but just with much faster clock speed. And that obviously does show here in the performance. And now we're going to move over to a piece of GeForce news, and this comes to us from NVIDIA's CFO, Colette Cress, in a recent earnings call. I'll link in the video description for this particular piece of news as well. Now, it's not an exact answer, but it does give us a couple of 
questions that we need to raise. She essentially said that Turing and Pascal will be coexisting until the holiday period. So what that basically means for several months, we're going to be seeing the 10 series along with the 20 series. So the questions are then, does that mean we're not going to see the 60 and below arrive anytime soon for the uh, 20 series of cards? And does that also mean that we won't see the laptop launches? Or does that mean that NVIDIA are just going to be slowly phasing out the cards and reducing the cost of them as much as possible just to clear back inventory? Without question, the GTX 1080, for example, is still a very, very, very compelling product. If you're running 1440p or even a high refresh rate 1080p screen, the GTX 1080, the GTX 1070 are very nice cards indeed. Of course, they don't quite manage to hit 4K, but that's what the GTX 1080 Ti is for. So to me, it's going to be fascinating to see how these products become end of the line. It wasn't too long ago, a couple of days ago, that Overclockers UK did mention that their inventory of 10 series cards is starting to run out and that's why you're going to start to see the prices of the 10 series start to go back up because obviously supply and demand people have jumped on the 10 series cards because they were really cheap at the time you can pick up some really good deals and in fact there wasn't that much of a price difference at one point anyway between the 1070 the 1070 ti the 1080 although the 1080 ties and they did manage to hold a nice price premium. So what we're going to be seeing on the laptops, apparently we will see the 10, um, apparently there will be the 2080s launch at some point. And that's one of the rumors we're going, that's going around right now for mobile. But whether that actually happens this side of uh, Christmas or not, who knows? If you are interested in picking up a cheap 10 series card though, there are a couple of affiliate links in the video description which you can go ahead and check out. But once again, if these prices go up over the next couple of days, I wouldn't be surprised because once again, uh, retailers are getting rid of their inventory really fast. So whether Nvidia have more cards or rather more GPUs that they can fill up that inventory with, no one really knows for sure. I also want to put out a small update concerning a story I covered a few days ago, and that is that AMD will be unveiling, supposedly, X499 at CES. The website Tweaktown allegedly has some rumours that we might actually indeed be seeing that very thing, but there's a little more to it, and this concerns Fred Ripper 3000. According to their industry rumblings, a couple of months ago they heard that the X499 platform is going to be there to battle Intel's own X599, and that will support uh, processes up to 28 cores, 56 threads, that is Intel's platform. Threadripper does have the 2990WX, which is uh, up to 32 cores, 64 threads, but AMD are not satisfied right now. Allegedly, the Ryzen Threadripper 3000 series is being known as Castle Peak, and we will see AMD push their foot harder down, this is a quote from the website on Intel's neck, where we might even see PCIe 4.0 support, as well as 64 cores, 128 threads with the next generation of Epic processors. Now, I'm not quite sure whether we're going to see that amount of threads for the consumer side. I imagine it would make uh, the Threadripper process is really expensive. And as for the release date, that would also be rather interesting. The original rumors that we heard regarding the X499 is that there might be a few smaller architectural tweaks. The original rumor that we heard also made mention that we're going to see additional bandwidth across the board with improvements on PCIe. So it is possible that PCIe 4.0 could be a thing. After all, from what we also understand, after all, Vega 7NM, Vega 20 if you prefer, does support PCIe 4.0. And we learned that through a Linux patch just a few days ago. So it would appear that AMD are readying for this additional memory bandwidth that of course we can find thanks to PCIe 4.0. I would take Threadripper having up to 64 cores, 128 threads with a pinch of salt right now though. It would mean an awful lot of processing power for home users and I don't necessarily know if AMD would want to cannibalize so much of the market share that they could snag from Epic. But then it's possible we could see a smaller number of cores for home users. For example, we could see 48 cores or something like that, which I wouldn't be too surprised about. Another possibility as well with the X499 and 
uh, the next generation of Epic is we could see an increase in the total amount of memory channels available. Once again, if they went too aggressive, it could possibly interfere with the Epic line of processors. So it's going to be very interesting to see that balancing act that AMD managed to achieve here. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. No more stuff, like, share, comment and subscribe and I'll see you soon. Just a quick reminder, I will be traveling to Seattle. I'm heading towards the hotel tomorrow. There will still be content uploaded, including a couple of interviews that I'm going to be going to and a few other uh, really cool things. But, you know, just letting you know that uh, sometimes I may not be in front of the camera, just depending on what happens on that particular day. So sometimes it might only be audio with, uh, you know, slides a little bit like we used to do a couple of months ago. So just letting you know. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care and bye for now.